Uh, morning, guys. So I hope you're all good. I hope you keep it safe. Uh, I think I'll start with a brief introduction of myself. Um, my name is Brian Wookie. I, I, I am a digital market currently. I'm working at a company called Brand D. Uh, before that, I have previously worked in advertising agencies based on coming up with strategies for media buying and the recent four years uh, digital media buying. So I had a glimpse of, of sort of the current situation that's going on, um, the pandemic as you know it, <clears throat> and what, what I wanted to base uh, be now on is just taking a step back and looking at a couple of global crises, crises that have been uh, that have occurred and various marketing and advertising tactics that have been used so that you can at least see if we can borrow something from what is done in the past or what you can brush up on right now. Uh, you also notice that at the end we'll talk a bit about a couple of predictions that people have in regards to what will happen in the marketing trends that will uh, showcase themselves after, do, after this pandemic. Most of them are predictions, so we can't set up in on them, but there will be uh, there's a 70 or 70% 70 chance of uh, confidence level that we can include it in our strategies as we wait for that. So the webinar will... Uh, will be posted first. I'll take you through a couple of crises that happened. So this is sort of a history lesson on what happened, on what, ha what has happened before. Uh, I don't know if some of you are history fans, but I've tried to simplify it. Then a couple of strategies that have been during that time. Then secondly, we'll come to, we'll come and check the current situation now. So what are brands doing now? What are, now in terms of marketing, in terms of advertising, and how and how they actually how they have responded in a period of time. So again, now we have the benefit of digital platforms. So most of what currently being done now, you'll find that is based on digital. Because again, that's the quickest uh, to send out information to your consumers. It's the easiest to get responses. It's the easiest to connect basically right now. Yeah. Then we'll have a look at a couple of predictions, a simple glimpse of, of what the future may be. So so how marketing will change, how a couple of a couple of industries will be affected by this. Then we'll have a QA session where we'll get to ask me or ask any questions that you may. Good. So I'll go straight into it. Um, I'll share my screen for the presentation, then you can have a look, and then I take you through it. So marketing and communication global crisis. Uh, it's like I said, we we'll start with the history of global crisis, uh, marketing strategies, marketing and notable marketing communication strategies used, uh, marketing and communication in the present. Uh, last glimpse of it. So uh, in terms of crisis, I mapped it out across four pillars of, of four events that have happened in the past. One is, a, one is World War I, uh, the second one is World War II. Then we have the Great, the great Depression. Then fourth, we look at the Spanish flu and how it's affected. So starting the World War, so we also know it as the first, the first World War, the Great War, 
international conflict uh, happened in 1914 and 1980s, 19. Uh, it pitted the central power, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Turkey against France, Britain, Russia, Italy, Japan. So it ended with again, the defeat of the central powers with the allies winning, uh, just a glimpse of what happened in that time. Then we are looking at a couple of advertisements and sort of marketing communication that was sent out during that period. So the four ads that I had to, that I was able to dig up was one by Barbary, uh, the, trench, the trench outfit, that's what they call it. So this was, again, an outfit that was used by the well famous designer called Barbary. Then we have the Swan Fountain pen. So this is basically a fountain pen that was used into uh, used to jot a couple of uh, a couple of various uh, letters uh, to the loved ones and all. Then we have the portable gramophone. This was very it was very key for the for the for the warriors who, and the army people who were out during war. So what it did it help? It helped them again pass some time uh, during the during the period when they were digging the churches and all that, yeah. So when we have a look at these four ads, a couple of things that you can basically take out. So what happened was one, people sort of people sort of sold or brands sold a very functional sort of gifts. So in terms of functionality, you see a fountain pen which was a real hit during that time. And basically the campaign messaging that was behind it was, you can easily write a, love, a, a letter to your loved ones back home. You can tell them how you're doing and they as well write back to you. Uh, especially during the time of war, you know that soldiers uh, really need that code that everything is well at home. And a small and simple letter will take them to a better place uh, when they are fighting and all that. So that functional sort of market that involves the brand selling, only selling the, the product itself, that emotion side, how a, how a letter from home would, uh, would resonate to us all. So the same thing we'll see is that the, in terms of functionality, the gramophone, the portable gramophone uh, played a, a huge role. This was, was, of course, soldiers during war. You remember of oh, during the World War, World War One, the strategy that uh, soldiers in France and the United Kingdom were using was the digging of the trenches. So once they dig the trenches across the mud and all that, sometimes they would sleep in the trenches. So something like a portable gramophone that helped them or give them morale so that they can listen to some music as they continue. continue with the, their war act <clears throat> uh, after a long day of war when they're in the camp they can at least jump to something so you see a functionality in that uh, in that way so back home now apart from so back home a couple of other things were also sold so one of them was cigarettes uh guard dogs this was sort of uh, a relief that people used to so again You'll find that in subsequent crises that during World War II and all that, things like entertainment, um, liquor, cigarettes, such such products really sold during that time because people are sort of looking for an escape from all that's going on. Okay, and I'll take you straight to World War II, but before that, I wanted you to have a look at the artwork and the presented. Uh, the ads that were done during that time. So you find that there's a lot of a lot of heavy, heavy reliance on copywriting. So they didn't really have the dailies. So the, the daily newspaper never really worked well for them. So what they did was use a lot of use a lot of uh, magazines that were that were by by monthly or monthly. So what happened was the copywriters uh, the copywriters did a very great job in terms of, in terms of uh, selling the idea and taking the idea home. So when your thoughts fly home, such small copy would shout very well during that time. And yeah, 
So we also found that there's a huge reliance on on copy, more more different from today where we have so much reliance on the artwork itself. So now quite visually driven, but during that time we really sold. Yeah. So yeah, I think I'll take you now to World War II. So we know it was forced between the Axis power and the Allied powers, that's German, Italy, and Japan, against uh, Britain, the state, the Soviet Union. Um, it was the deadliest war with 7 million people dead. Um, a brief history of how it started and ended. It started with uh, Germany invading Poland, then it ended with the two catastrophes that when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, then after that, in the U.S. responded with an atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, most of which the effects all fell till today. That was how big the war was, and so many steps are being taken right now to see how this cannot happen again. Yeah? So a glimpse of the ad uh, that ran during the war, and a glimpse of how marketing and advertising was done during World War II. So World War II was a bit advanced. It was now, because of the war, we had more communication, uh, advanced levels in terms of communication. Now the telephones were starting to come in, um, the automobiles, the cars, and all that. So we find that a couple of takeouts that we can get from this is one, most companies, uh, so much more of what we are seeing now, you see that there is they started a participation between government and brands and institutions. So more like we're seeing today, so where the government will help and make sure brands give out correct communication. We see brands even online tweeting against the Ministry of Health and getting most information from the Ministry of Health. So so much of the collaboration we have seen before in World War II. And how this happened was, uh, I'll guess an example is in the States. So it was this uh, war advertising council, yeah? So a war advertising council uh, breached the gap between the government and uh, brands and private institutions. And how this helped was since uh, the government needed a lot of money to fund the war, they tried to sell to consumers what you call a war bonds. So what a war bond is, is basically like a, a normal government bond. So you give, you buy a war bond at a future date, you might redeem it for, uh, from the government. So the government uh, partnered with brands and institutions to make sure that they sell the war bonds to them. So how they did it was quite interesting. Uh, so the advertisements that were placed were based on the brand itself. Let's say, for example, uh, on your screen, in the first ad on the left, so that's an advertisement of a tire, yeah? So instead of selling the tire itself, what they did was, in collaboration with governments, post messaging such as, uh, for 30 years, uh, generals will have always been the worth the price. However, don't buy our tires now. Support the government, buy war bonds. Then after all this has happened, now you can come back to buying tires. Yeah. A second example would be Bell and Howell, who, who are among the pioneers in the telephones. So again, the key communication they sent out was, uh, don't buy our telephones now. We know we... Know we, we we have the gadgets and we know you want them, but please don't buy them now. Just use that money, buy war bonds, store them, then later on you can come and buy. Yeah, so that's sort of a post uh, a collaboration between the government and advertising council. And how they ensured this happened was by giving a lot of incentive to the companies. So, for example, if a company was put out such an ad that and with our product, don't buy our product, then wait for the war, then you can buy it. They will get something like tax incentives of over 70% of their business. They will also get goodwill with, um, with the public itself. 
uh, the company would be in good terms with the government. Again, more, more or less what we are seeing today and uh, how it's affecting, it's affecting communication in the present day. So apart from that, we'll, uh, World War II, there was a lot of selling of hope. So what this happened was after one, one and a half or two years of the war, uh, people were quite sure who was going to win the war. And that was the States and the France, the Allied forces. So what happened was advertisers now took that angle and sold products based on future or dream or more of a post-war dream, yeah? So how this happened was most of the ads were based on uh, futuristic, futuristic sort of predictions on what consumers, what life will be after the war. So a couple of examples I have on my screen. So one is a housing, housing where people sort of imagine this post, post-war housing would be so good You'd have your automatic home laundry system. You'd have your automatic dishwashers. Motorola focused on a refinement of the stereo hi-fi, which really make your home sound, the sound in your home be quite good. And you'll see after total war, total living, that sort of, um, that was sort of, if we have, we had sort of a hard tag that will be during that time. So under such a banner, people would predict and talk so much about what will happen uh, post-war and trying to sell the dream after the war. So this, this again, made people feel quite optimistic. So people who are not that, um, that worried about what's going to happen, but now focusing on what will happen afterwards, yeah? Um, I think another the last takeout from, from World War II was that now, after, after the war ended, we find that a lot of products started streaming in because of the, the forces that joined. So you find that trade between Britain and France was more between England, uh, between Britain and the States increased. You'd find that there was a lot of a lot of products jetting into the into the countries that are a bit foreign. So now the uh, advertising or the band communication had to find a way to uh, find a way to take this advertise, take and market the products to the consumers, not necessarily but not necessarily diminishing the quality of the goods or the sold or produced in the country, but also showing that there are other product supplements they can get from other countries. Yeah. Then the next crisis was the Great Depression. So it was again the worst economic downturn in the history. Uh, what happened during the Great Depression was natural, the, the New York Stock Exchange of the stock market there's a lot of stockpiling and buying or pouring savings into stocks. And as a result, there was rapid expansion of stock markets. However, the goods produced internally, the level of employment, the, yeah, the, the pro profitability and the productivity of products being sold, uh, or being sold as stocks was not as much. So what happened is, the market basically crashed. This, this led to, again, a lot of unemployment. Uh, very bad. You find that there's, <clears throat> there's a record of people even sleeping in their uh, in cars at some point because they couldn't afford housing. Uh, the government tried to give subsidies, what they would call supras. So what this happened was every once in a day, people would line up. America line up to just wait for a bowl of soup that was provided and bread by the government. So you find that it was a really hard time. But again, during this time, marketing still continued. Um, in terms of such, such a period, 
we can have a glimpse of a couple of industries that thrived during that time, so to speak, and a couple of, and a couple of companies that really went to the decline. So in terms of companies that really thrived, one, we had uh, the cigarettes or the illegal, the illicit sector of the economy. So the cigarettes, the gambling increased during that time because people, again, are looking for sort of an end from all this. Yeah. Number two, you find that the entertainment industry sort of boomed in a way. And this was because unlike, unlike other luxury uh, categories of goods, you find that entertainment companies uh, using the public theaters and the movies, the plays sort of benefited because people felt, people felt like they didn't have the money to buy other luxuries. But if you can save up a bit and take your family for a movie at the theaters, that will sort of give them uh, a hope or sort of a release from the normal uh, catastrophe that's happening. So just give people a, a sigh of, of relief away from it all. So the entertainment industry really boomed in this time. And it was in terms of the theaters and the cinemas. Uh, something that's very notable in that time was The Wizard of Oz was actually produced uh, during the Depression. It was one of the movies that started really high uh, in terms of watches and people going to the cinema to watch. Uh, second thing was Monopoly was actually invented during the Great Depression. And you find the reason why the people invented it, one was, again, it provided a good escape. You could just buy your board, go home with your family, have some time, and just, and just have that bonding time playing a game. Number two, you find that Monopoly is quite, uh, it's quite thought through in terms of investing where you save uh, introduction of institution banking and what and what. So what part of, part of the game was help future Americans? So the kids would grow up in having a culture of how to invest, how to save, how to do all this. So that again, the economy will not face this again. So again, the tobacco and alcohol industries actually increased spending during this time. So before they never used to spend as because the products sold. But during this time, you find a huge chunk of print, uh, the print ads and all that was based on, was spending from tobacco and alcohol industries. The food advertisements also went high. So in terms of uh, selling food at wholesale prices, such such people uh, sort of sought a lot of advertising and hit. However, a couple of industries that went down, number one is the fashion industry. You can see on the third, on the third, uh, on the slide, the third advertisement, 12 good reasons for buying far codes. So what happened, such prices of far codes, like $205, $275, this was pre the depression period. But later on after that, you found that advertisers like Burberry and uh, rich advertising are not in the right space to buy or afford such goods. Um, during the depression, we'll also see something that's very significant. Uh, you found that the jobs were quite limited, yeah? So uh, employment was only in industries, uh, that's the manufacturing industry. So what the government again did or said was each family cannot have more than one, more than one working. So this was to ensure that each family had at least one who will be the breadwinner and bring the and bring at least some money home, some food home, and all that. So what happened was, again, they augmented the jobs as part of the gender. So again, what this meant was women were encouraged to stay home. However, men were encouraged to go to work in the industries and, and bring food home. So the gender roles were split directly by the government. So men again to the factories to the industries but then to avoid uh 
to also include women or to give them like a soft landing. So what happened was companies now started advertising to the women to show them the benefits of staying at home. So sort of telling them, okay, we've told you to stay home, but again, there are so many things that you can get from staying at home. So the gender roles, um, I don't think this can actually be done today, but in the way they, they separated them uh, and now started advertising goods based on the ladies who are staying at home. A good example would be the, the Coca-Cola ad that was put out. So the pose that refreshes at home. So this was just encouraging ladies, like after doing all the laundry, after doing all the housework, you can now take a Coca-Cola and just uh, pose off. So another second one was Drano. Drano was sort of a, it's sort of like a vim, so it cleans, cleans veins and all that. So again, you see the copy that the copy that goes out with that was was look for cleanliness even down the drains. Again, as I say, I don't see a this ever happening because of the laws that were put into place to guard both the men, the male and the females within various industries. So again, that was a good takeout during the period. Then. Apart from those three, now we can have a look at uh, a catastrophe that is sort of home now. And now our best case study is the Spanish flu. So it was really very bad and it killed an estimated of 20 to 50 million people. Uh, it started in, the, in Europe, then it spread into parts of Asia and the United States. Same patterns that we are sort of seeing with the COVID-19. So again, there are no effective drugs or vaccines. So what happened was citizens were really ordered to wear masks. Uh, the same communication that is being currently being driven right now. However, they wouldn't really tell people to do social distancing. Main reason for this was during the war or do or during a period of war. So you can't really tell there's no social distance. So what happened was, was people continued their daily lives and their daily jobs. However, they have just appealed to wear masks. Uh, I think something buzzer to note is that the Spanish flu originates into, uh, from Spain. However, Spain was, Spain was the only one that was allowed to cover the news since during the war, it was a neutral country. It was not uh, either on the central, on the central or, or the other. So what happened was Spain was quite a neutral country, so it allowed, it was easy for them to, uh, to give the news to the world. Yeah, A couple of pictures you'll see there, you have the masks, however, people are going to games, uh, people are still going on with their work and all that. So during the Spanish flu, we find so many, so, so many um, similarities as communication that is being pushed right now. So soap, uh, detergents, uh, wear masks, save your life. These are sort of the ads that were put out during that time. So a couple of, to see that life boy, so was actually doing there after the Spanish flu, so, or during the Spanish flu. So then you have sunlight soap, uh, ivy soap, uh, Yardley's lavender soap. So again, the same, sort of the same communication that we're seeing now, where uh, 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 sort of brands like who are trying to put out the word there first and get consumers to be educated on how to, how to wash, how to wash their hands, how to keep clean, how to wear a mask and all that. So these are the sort of the ads that were put during that time, sort of an banner called Soap Saves Lives. So basically use soap and save lives. So again, during that time, same as today, we have uh, people who advertise. I think an example in Kenya was the, uh, 
when the Ministry of Health read, readed a clinic in Lambton or Yaya Center because of false advertising. Same thing we're seeing today is the same thing that happened during that time. So many people came out with false claims that they could cure Spanish influenza or cure or cure the flu. And act, they actually put advertisements out, sort of again, what we're seeing now. So uh, you put an ad daily saying you can do this just to get people who are sort of naive to buy your services. So out of all that, the four crises that we've talked about, there are a couple of takers that we can, we can get. So one, like during World War I, you had a lot of functionality selling, yeah? So selling of functional products and goods. What that applies to now is people selling a lot of uh, face masks, uh, local producers who are going to the, into the process, to the business of manufacturing these face masks, face masks, selling them and delivering them to your door. So then you have a lot of functional on hygiene products. So that's the soap, the sanitizers, all that, yeah. Another similarity we can see between every global crisis and today is marketing collaboration between both brands, institutions, and the government. So during this time, you find that brands, institutions, and governments have to come together and find a way that they will steer, steer during steer during this steer citizens in the right way during this period. And even now, we find that so many corporates have joined into donations, giving donations, giving um, alternative solutions that consumers can use just to make sure everything is going on smoothly. Uh, another very keen thing to notice is, of course, during the pandemic, during a pandemic, there is a shift, a growth and decline in various industries. So for example, the entertainment industry right now is a bit wobbly. So the events that you that you can do, the the various activities that you would do, the clubbing, the what the what has sort of declined. Uh, there has been, of course, a decline in fashion because most of us are just staying home in our t-shirts, home branded t-shirts, as well as pajamas, not really thinking a lot about fashion. Even when you're going out, you're maybe going out for a small quick run, not really thinking of how you should. Uh, look as much so also a decline in fashion has currently has been inspired by the closing of malls so most of the fashion shops uh, are located in malls which are sort of a no-go zone right now unless you're getting essential products so something that has has been but now has sort of morphed or changed is the use of print and copywriting. So we find evident during most of the crisis, print media and copywriting played a key role. However, uh, in now the 21st century, we are seeing that digital media is taking the position in terms of driving consumers. So it's in the tweets by both the government, brands and institutions, if it's in the short videos, on the social media platforms, if it's the use of YouTube, uh, if the use of even SMS marketing, just to give consumers uh, information on how to protect themselves, how they can go about to their normal lives during this period, I would just see that shift. The communication in some cases is the same. Uh, for example, during Spanish flu and COVID-19, Again, a difference of a thousand years, but you find the communication that is sent out is clearly the same. However, how it's being sent out, the channels that are being used now have sort of changed from the normal print media to this media a lot. Then after all this, now we can have a look at the current, what's currently happening now. So the current situation on the ground right now, and I'll take you through a couple of local brands uh, that are initiating what you call sort of alternative solutions, as well as as well as giving as well as giving consumers a way to use to educate them on how to about this period.
something a lot brand and government backed endorsements or public service announcements so this is between the ministry of health brands and institutions and brands are championing this to one and not so sort of a social uh social responsibility so it's donations that they're sending to the well uh, the kenyan kitty for covid if it's a way of raising awareness on alternative products and services that can be used with a lot of um, sort of partnership between both the government and brands. So if it's banking and being told to cap or to move uh, that people in car when sending money, et cetera. So again, people, brands are also doing this to show the solidarity and effort mission being taken uh, worldwide. So a couple of brands, and how they've executed this. Uh, one, you've seen that all, the ad that has been running cross channel, that's on TV, radio, as well as the talk. So that's public service, the public service announcement. So wash hands, cough, wear a mask, and all this. Uh, number two, we've seen Life Boy also. If they are, this is not an ad or a simple guideline sort of fight coronavirus. So we are also resolution insurance coming into the mix using sort of steps that people can take, how to remove a mask, how to wash your hands and all this. I'm sure all, all of this communication we are currently seeing as part of our consumer education plan. Yeah, then something else that has been used is the drive of alternative solutions. So you're telling consumers that they can do this. What else can they do? So Safaricom, for example, has, has used the bonga points patches. So you can redeem your bonga point to buy certain goods and food uh, during this quarantine period. We had bank, banking institutions are selling a lot of alternative channels. So pay your bills via, don't come to the, you don't necessarily need to come to the, uh, the branch do this, pay your bills using the MPESA, using your team numbers, make online purchases and all that. Um, also, insurance industry, uh, industry players are using this to sort of shift people from the normal insurance to them self-purchasing insurance using the portal. Then some interesting, we found out the Khan University is looking for a way to, to use teleneurology. So, remote screening of people using the tools that are available. So again, these are sort of alternative solutions that brands are using just to take consumers during this period, make sure everyone has all they need during this time. I'm sure this we have seen is co companies will go to drive social distancing. So this is sort of uh, making people sort of that other angle that we are not used to. Uh, some of these logos have been implemented, some of them have not been, are just concept notes, but they're quite interesting to see that normally it's very, very hard to alter a company's logo, uh, especially a company that has been in, in existence for a very long period of time, which we're seeing in an effort to deliver a certain message, again, very led. Hello. Sorry, we had a bit of a glitch, but I'll I'll continue right now. So back to this, you see that companies are using logos to drive a lot of social distancing. And this is sort of an alter from what they normally have, just to drive the messaging itself. 
uh, before 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 we sort of to break, I wanted to emphasize on the difference that now visual sort of the visual uh, visual drive to application that is that we are currently using now. Uh, apart from or uh, taking in contrast what was used before. So how people use copywriting a lot. Now you see a simple, a simple visual attraction of a logo would trigger something that the consumer would be would be aware of. So another pillar I have looked at is the emergence of unlimited online opportunities. So the current state of affairs has forced brands and institutions to morph from the again brick and mortar model to the online wider space. So if people can't access the source, if people can come to your store, if people can't come to your church, what can you do? So what we found out is there's uh, a huge drive in messaging using digital channels. This is especially for brands and institutions who want to drive important messaging. So this is churches, schools, and all that. Then we've also seen uh, brands trying to efficiently retain their seamless supply and demands and uh, seamless supply and demand of the goods and services. So people are shifting from going to sit at a Java house. So how else can the consumers get your products? So this is again through online delivery. Um, if you're taking it to them, are you giving them a sort of incentive? Will it be cheaper and all this? Then another thing we have seen is some brands, especially in the entertainment business, are to continue to connect and engage their audiences with a mimicked atmosphere. Uh, and a, a good example of this is a live DJ sessions that people are having online. Uh, the use of various channels like YouTube to drive a certain theater or, or play or a, a symphony sort of, in a way. So, in terms of this, we've seen that churches have actually come on board uh, into the use of, of online means to drive messaging. We saw this especially during Easter Sunday where the, with the mass, the mass with Pope Francis, people actually had to stream live <clears throat> and the church was sort of not very full, again, because of social distancing, but again, there was a way to drive the messaging. We're also seeing it in local churches, uh, the Catholic Church, uh, we're seeing the Anglican Church also holding live sessions on Sundays and all this just to make sure that the message is put across. So apart from this, there are also a couple of, a couple of uh, brands that have stood out, especially in the in the sector of online live sessions. So we see a brand like Zeraki, which offers with an app that you download and it offers studies based on the current curriculum and can help your, ch your child study during that time. You can give them a slide session, uh, take them through a couple of lessons, uh, show them where they failed in the quizzes and all this. Again, enabled a lot by the digital digital space. Then of course, there's a mimicked live atmosphere where a lot of DJs, a lot of artists are performing live on the Instagram, uh, live on YouTube. Uh, an example would be of course Nyashinsky who just did an, a really nice live uh, YouTube session like two weeks ago, just to make sure, give that mimicked atmosphere of people being in a band, uh, in a, a live session. However, you're still, you're still giving them the entertainment that they need. So something also that has been very interesting is the emergence of unlimited online opportunities. So again, in, re in retrospect of what's happening, some brands have been sort of quote unquote lucky uh, to have leveraged the period to penetrate the market due to an abnormal demand of their services and products. So a couple of services we didn't know existed before all this started are now starting to come up. And how this has affected is all of a couple of industries or cross, cross communications. So one of them is e-commerce platforms. So the delivery of essential and goods. This is the Jumia Global, the Uber Eats, MyDawa. Then 
you have the, the online and offline gaming industry, um, the on-demand video platforms such as Netflix and Hulu, uh, so, <clears throat> social connection apps and online working tools such as TikTok, House Party, Zoom, cloud services. Then we've also seen a huge rise in health and fitness apps that people use taking a walk, exercising at home, and all this. So, quote unquote, the e-commerce boom has been again locally and internationally. We're seeing so many brands, alternative solutions, so giving us a way to connect or to buy our products and services from them and enjoy the experience necessarily by not necessarily going to the So we have Uber Eats, uh, Glovo Kenya, we have Sky Garden, KFC Delivery, TurnupYam.com, you have your Java, MyDawa, and all this. And internationally, internationally, we have Amazon, Starbucks Delivers, Mac Deliver. There's just a couple of examples. So based on, based on industry leaders, what people are actually saying might happen during the period is, or post this period is consumers or faster online buyers are becoming the bulk of people who are actually buying online. So this means people who are, were used to the normal brick and mortar stores are now starting to online buy because again, they have no choice. People are starting to order in food, people who are relatively not used to that. People are actually sending people to shop for them in the Glovo, Glovo and Nivas uh, partnership. So send a shopping list and people and, and goods are delivered to your, to your house. So you're seeing a lot of shift on the area for the consumer themselves. Uh, again, forced by this current circumstances. Uh, then People are also saying, actually, uh, is also saying that the trend might continue this way. So the reliance on e-commerce, it again shifts the mind of consumers because, hi, I don't want to, to spend three hours going to Sari Center to, go to shop if I can send someone to get that for me as I drive home or as I continue working from the office, then I just get my goods and that's a plus for me. So that's sort of shift of the consumer mindset is them to, to continue in a way, because now the convenience can be easily seen. Yeah, then most of the goods that are online are fast moving consumer goods. So as well as computing, computing products and accessories. So entertainment, electronics, TVs, home theaters. Uh, we'll discuss this later in the gaming, in the gaming, online gaming and the gaming section where PlayStation, Nintendo's are actually out of the market or the resale of the resale price of a Nintendo would be twice as much as a normal price because the demand is very, very high in that. So next we'll discuss the of again on demand video platforms. So Netflix, Hulu, uh, Disney Plus, which launched not so long ago, Twitch, Amazon Prime Video, which as well. Um, then the online gaming experiences. But before we get to that, just a couple of notes note on, on the online, the online on-demand platform. So this is Netflix and Hulu and all this. So in terms of, in terms of data, we found that in one week of, uh, in March, when most, most countries uh, enacted the stay at home initiative or the sort of lockdown. For the collective data usage during that time, more users streamed up to one, 116, 106 billion minutes in one week. So, this is people just being at home and watching across the various platforms. Then you find that 75 of most of the people who did that were age 35 and below. Because again, we are accustomed to catch on to series and all this. So what happened was during that time when we all stay at home, we find people again the quickest quickest entertainment you would look for is Netflix or Hulu or Disney Plus and that. Yeah. Each each uh, each provider saw 
a huge increase of up to 43% in the searches uh, platforms. So that's Disney Plus, HBO, Netflix. And another, another very interesting point that uh, during the, sec the month of March, the EU had to have a sit down with all on-demand video platforms in Europe. That's Netflix, Amazon, Disney Plus, and YouTube. The reason being, the, the EU communications uh, directory or arm or department found out that people are streaming too much, and this might affect this affects the bandwidth and explains various networks. Uh, so this means that not only ent entertainment will suffer, but that sort of clog of so many people streaming, it could also affect our communication channels, telephone. Um, tele telephone and internet as well. So what happens is the EU had to sit down with all the streaming on-demand streaming platforms and tell them to reduce the percentage of traffic of people coming into the coming into the streams at a certain period of time. So apart from this, Netflix was especially Netflix was told to reduce the quality of the videos just to reduce the bandwidth they're using in terms of streaming. So you find out, I don't think this has ever been witnessed before, but you find that the streaming services are becoming so huge and they're bring, coming, with, coming with a lot of traffic and use of bandwidth that the government uh, tells you, like, just relax on it because you might affect other communications, yeah? So that was something interesting to note. Uh, then in terms of gaming experiences. So you have the normal gaming, that's the PlayStation. However, in the recent two years, we've seen introduction of online, online gaming platform. So this basically you can just log in using your PC, using your phone, just game online. So this is the Google Stadia, the PlayStation Now, which is again available on the go. We have the popular Nintendo Switch that is not very popular here, however, it's used a lot. So again, during this period, a lot of people started gaming. So for example, Nintendo resale prices, like I said, doubled within the market because people are buying so much of them. Then certain online gaming platforms have seen a rise to 20 million people online gaming just for, just for gaming purposes, yeah? So what this happened was WHO sort of recognized that when you're telling people to stay at home, gaming is the fastest among the things that they will do. So they came up with a, with a campaign uh, that's currently running, that's in collaboration with WHO and the gaming service providers. It's called Play Apart Together. What Play Apart Together is basically a campaign that encourages people to stay at home, however, still continue uh, chatting together, using games, uh, various activities, rewards. Uh, I'm sure most of us have seen, have been interacting with a lot of gaming ads. If not so, just currently, as you're streaming on, or as you're just scrolling your social media feeds, some of us will notice that there are so many ads in the to game. So that's an initiative, WHO and gaming services called Apart Together. What they're trying is to drive social distancing, however, encourage the, the gelling of, of uh, people in such, on such platforms. So apart from that, um, the UK department uh, to encourage social distancing made sure that certain games, on popular games like Candy Crush and Farm Heroes, you had a ban or an ad that stay, stay home and stay lives. Again, Gaming platforms, which are maybe previously neglected, are now becoming sort of channels that people are running to, to not only drive, drive communication, but also encourage certain, certain citizen, uh, citizen acts. So that's a rundown of, of both the on-demand video platforms and the and gaming platforms. Now we go into the various apps that we use. So I got a couple of graphs uh, that state the most downloaded, app, most downloaded ads, uh, apps during this time. 
And we found that our heated culture's weekly time spent on apps has grown over 20% ever, start, ever since people started staying at home. So this means a rise in the social media apps, uh, TikTok, um, music apps, uh, streaming apps like Netflix and Spotify, with a graph, a graph showing the differences between Q4 and Q1 now. So what apps are people mostly using? So we have uh, social sort of social apps. We have Instagram Live. We have uh, TikTok, which has grown really big during this time. We have a uh, house party, which allows people to sort of have a, a video, video sort of party where they can communicate with their friends and kin. Um, other thing has been the increase in the apps used during fitness so if it's the strava apps that people are using after afternoon joke if you're trying to monitor your heart as you cycle indoors or as you go cycle or as you go for cycling for seven and all that then another rise that has been seen is on zoom and google google hangouts which are primary tools that have been used for working from home so you find that among these three categories, there has been a very huge increase. Um, to precisely talk about it, you find that TikTok uh, house party downloads grew over 735 times from a week prior. So the week before, people were told to stay, actually stay at home, find that people now started downloading house party and globally, the downloads grew by 735 times from the week prior. Uh, health, fitness, education, and business app have seen a growth of 40, 30, 35%, and 30% during that period. I find that Zoom has become a household name now. Never, very few people actually know about the app and its usage. And, uh, Something else to note is the spend, the spend that people are on apps. I know the, the use of subscriptions on apps such as Apple Music and all this has grown to over 31 billion, again, globally during this period. So the emergence and the surgence of apps to fit into our lifestyle, to fit into our various habits that we have to continue such as work, to fit into our, our social lives, in terms of interacting with our friends, with our family and all that, have all come to fit in the gap that has been, for, for a particular reason, been put, uh, been null and void at that time. Then, I think that our last bit was just to check a glimpse of the future and what is bound to happen uh, after all this has happened. Sorry, after we've gone through this period. So again, like I said before, these are major predictions and based, based from a point of optimism that we shall go through, this, go through this period well and we shall not put as much debt and we shall be able to sort of contain the situation before it becomes uh, really bad. So a couple of predictions that have been said, uh, that have been mentioned is one, everything goes digital. Again, from what I've been talking about in the last 20 minutes, you find that most of, most of communications have, sh have definitely shifted to digital. Uh, number two, in terms of brands and consumers, there will definitely be a quantum shift in media consumption and spend to digital channels from your above line channels, from use of traditional media to again, digital media. Number three, we have a perpetual dominance of e-commerce. If it's delivery, if it's uh, shopping, uh, household shopping for essential, if it's food, if it's um, all the services, if it's even your battery, if you want it delivered, all these things will, will be dominated by e-commerce. Uh, something else what is is brand localization, and I'll go I'll go deeper into it uh, a couple of minutes. Then 
you have the shift of views, shift to use of interactive content, then further innovations that may stick the future. So with everything going digital, we'll find that now chat services will be forced that alongside every normal Sunday gathering, for example, people will demand that you do a video recording for them to watch later at home, et cetera. So if it's online webinars, if it's people uh, learning online, you'll, if it's teleconferences, if it's uh, all this online presentations, if it's use of Slack for group, for group and all that, you find that people will use and will run to digital channels as their first option. Then in terms of the quantum shift in media consumption and spends, uh, it is predicted by the drum that the social media spending will rise by 22.2%. So this means that budgets from other channels or communication that are being used, if it's email marketing, if it's um, display advertising, if it's um, traditional channels such as radio and TV, we are seeing that we're predicting that a 22% increase in spending on social media will be witnessed. And the reason for this is consumers are finding that apart from it being the best chance for you to reach as much as consumers, as much of consumers that you can, it's also a way for you to get that one-on-one -on -one interaction between the brand and your online consumer. So you can also sell a lot, however, sort of twisting the message in a motive way just to make sure, just even checking up on consumers, seeing how they're doing, giving them a discount for the hard times that are going on. So such as such practices that we're seeing now are seeing to, to light up, up the increase in social media spending in the future. Um, another research from then to Angus Network, we found that 14% of client leaders during this period have said that they're definitely moving their budgets from offline to online. So this means that they, again, the unlimited opportunities that they are online, client leaders are seeing that the next or the most suitable way for them to talk to consumers in now and also in the future and to maintain that brand presence within, within that scope is by the use of digital so we are seeing a shift in media consumption so again digital media agencies or digital agencies are most likely to win and also the client as well so again perpetual dominance of e-commerce i think we've we've sort of reached a period where normally if an e-commerce platform was to advertise themselves they will start with again the awareness, then sort of educate the consumers on how to navigate the platform. Then now maybe wait for conversions later on. But now we are seeing people have been forced to learn how to use the platforms. People have been forced to know the best platform to use. People have been referred to by their friends on the best platform to, if they are doing certain things, like if they are shopping for groceries, if they are they're ordering face masks online, if they are ordering food, if they're ordering cake for a birthday since now people can't go out and celebrate a birthday. So you find that people have been forced to one, be aware of these products, number two, educate themselves on how to use them. And now the bit of conversion will what e-commerce platforms will always aim for. People have unlimited knowledge on how to use on so many ways that now the dominance of e-commerce is is unattested. So other thing that, that has been predicted in localization. So what this means is, uh, for example, using as a, as a case study, you find that most of, the, most of our reliance had been on, on uh, China for certain products and services. So what happens is now uh, there is an uplift or the government is also trying to uplift local industries into uh, product manufacturing of products that can be used by the locals themselves. Uh, however, it comes with the difficulty. 
because we do have a consumer bias that products from our country are quote unquote not as good as products that we get from import. So what this have what this means for marketers is the challenge will definitely lay down on the marketing team to make sure that you, you sort of sell or market the products that are locally made by these local producers and industries and educate the consumers on the quality that they have vis-a-vis -vis the quality of imported goods that they have a bias towards. So um, the marketing, marketing teams will have a challenge in sort of breaking that breaking that bias that consumers have because again in the manufacturing in the production industry we'll see a lot of local produced goods and services so now it's just for marketers to see how to how to grind that car and make sure consumers trust the products that are locally made so that's sort of what call uh, the localization of the brands then the last last bit will be interactive content. So again, there's a prediction that by, the, by the end of 2020, 70% of enterprises will be experimenting with immersive technologies such as VR and AR have impact on sales. So the use of 360 videos online, the use of virtual tours, the use of VR shoppable online posts, again, I've been seeing to be driving a lot of engagement between consumers online. So a couple of players in the market, such as Oculus, have found that integrate experimenting with brand and brand seeing the value of the use of VR and AR now I will shift them into actual users. And I think the best example to use now would be, for example, now we're staying home. Yeah. So you're selling, you're selling a certain product. And, and you have the option of giving a VR experience or an AR experience on that. That will be very keen and will make you a market or a thought leader in that space since you're providing an alternative solutions to clients, even though they can't walk and come to see what you're doing. So uh, another example of how this has boomed during the COVID period is uh, what we call virtual tourism with a lot of a lot of monuments, a lot of historical uh, sites, both in Europe and across Africa, usually have the option of uh, a VR guided tour or an AR guided tour, a 360 video. So, what you're seeing is people can't travel right now. There are so many travel bans. Maybe you had a 2020 bucket list on the travel that you will do. However, since you can't, you don't have the luxury of enjoying that experience there's an option of actually enjoying that experience. And now we'll see more of that coming in. So if it's Airbnb, uh, sort of partnering with certain monuments and uh, certain uh, countries or uh, tourism, in, tourism sort of uh, boats in different countries in collaboration with Google and all this, just to show people have an immersive experience without even leaving where they are for the period of time. Again, nothing, I'm not, nothing beats going and seeing the place and taking pictures of your own and enjoying the place that you're going. However, with that option not on the table, the use of, of VR and AR will certainly be used uh, to bridge that gap. Then, under further innovations, uh, we've seen rise in drone delivery. So, Tech giants like Amazon and Google uh, use, use, usually start, uh, actually start experimenting on the use of drones for delivery. Then this was just sort of a pilot program. But then after the coronavirus started spreading, we find that China took over the drone delivery business in terms of delivering medical supplies and products to affected areas without necessarily uh, endangering the lives of the delivery, uh, the delivery agents. So again, that has Corona has sort of uh, first kicked uh, drone delivery. Now uh, consumers and parties will be very interested in 
and seeing how to include that in their delivery mechanics. Uh, apart from Amazon and Google, I'm sure the rise in demand and supply will eventually lead to Kenyan, uh, sort of like Kenyan market adapting to this. I uh, already know, uh, if, I'm not, if I'm not wrong, the government can now, the government now capped or rubbed off all the loads on flying a drone in Kenya. So now I think you can actually do them freely without really needing a license. These are certain, certain steps that in the future will guide again, e-commerce in terms of drone delivery. Uh, in such a case, if drone delivery was quite, uh, quite predominant now, you will stop endanger endangering the lives of the many people who sacrifice with their motorbikes just to bring your meal home. And I think on that note, I shall end um, open to questions. Uh, I have all the references. This is just a picture of what of the sort of uh, tools I uh, used. However, I'll share all of the research references if you want to read more, if you want to get to know more, if you want something to use in your presentation, I'll, I'll share that with everyone. Okay, so I think we're going to Q&A. Yeah, uh, So um, um, thanks a couple of uh, questions that have been posed. Um, So one person has asked, what can be done by the creative people to achieve, to achieve the sort of, uh, to achieve uh, what's, going, uh, what's going on? I think that's the question. So in, term, in terms of the creative process, um, first we're seeing a lot of, a lot of, um, reliance on audio on sort of audio and visual not only audio audio and visual uh, communication so what this means is many people are actually using, using video and visual uh, representations to put the message across my my take on the creative process is one it should be guided by what the consumer wants yeah. So if it's del delivering the message to them on what they need in terms of delivery and all that, we should do it. Then in something very something very key to note is during and after this period, there will be a lot of skepticism on all industries. So someone will be, we will still have the fear of going out. We'll still have fear of of going to malls, we'll still have the fear of, of meeting up in uh, clubs, we'll still have all that fear. So what this means as a brand in the creative process, your messaging should be sort of quite emotive to just to make people feel like everything is okay. And now you can go back to normal based on the guidelines. By the government. That's, that's my take on the creative process. Taking a sort of emotive approach will really help um during this time um another question was so what are some of the few things we can do to get more commissions and clients as creatives during this time i think as creatives uh during this time is just Sell to them, sell to them what they already know. So again, this gives 
uh, this gives us certain chance as digital digital marketers, if, if it's creative, if it's media, if it's all, all this that's happening. So you find that clients are sort of now sold that they need this in, the, in, the, uh, in their brands, they need this for their brands. So what you have to do is just approach it in a way that tags sales or conversions with the new, the new normal, what you would call it. So if you can find a way to bridge that up and show, and show brands that yes, they exist, is happening now and we can sort of not really take advantage but we can take this route and after six months our conversions or our sales will, will be beneficial so don't necessarily deep dive into sales don't take advantage of the situation it's not a good situation to take advantage of but there's a way you can show a map on how the future might look like and sell that to your clients so show them this will happen, and for this to happen, let's be prepared, and we can do this and this and this. Yeah. And Uh, someone has asked, asked a very interesting question. So Kenya has had challenges in the last mile de delivery because not everyone has an address and also smartphones. How will this e-commerce thing really work? Um, we have uh, e-commerce, again, starts from almost digital communication, starts from a central point. And in this case, our central point in Kenya is Nairobi or the Nairobi County, as you call it. So you find that with the sparring of a lot, a lot of reliance of e-commerce on a such section will again help it grow into other sections. For areas that are not really uh, accessible, I think a best example to use is Copia. Copia is now bridging the gap between online delivery, online e-commerce and Copia can bridge the gap between online e-commerce and delivery to areas that are not really uh, areas that are not really quite reachable. So one, they have tried, and now once they get those sort of roadmaps into those areas, now introduction of things like uh, use of smartphones, which sorry, use of uh, we call it. Uh, Use of collaborations. So let's say, for example, if an eco, uh, if an e-commerce platform wants to wants to launch in Kenya, yeah, and they want to set up in rural in the rural in the rural space. So what they will simply do to encourage or grow that e-commerce route, it's quite simple for them to partner with a partner like Techno or uh, Infinix and do something like a pre-installed app or pre-installed uh, app on the, smart, on the smartphones before they sell them or distribute them to these certain areas. So again, let's, let's not very re heavily rely on the government. The government is also doing enough in terms of the Google balloons that are, people are calling them. That's again one step during this COVID period that, that the government actually has initiatives to support. This. So apart from the government doing this, again, the government is there just to lay regulations and sort of help us find a way now to now the brands to step in and find out how they can do it or find other markets uh, themselves. Um, So another question is, what are Kenyan companies doing in dealing with rumors and concerning the COVID-19 issue management is becoming a great concern for corporates? Again, it is becoming a very great concern. Uh, I, will, I will, however, be of the opinion that during this time, the government has championed a lot of communication. So what has happened is people have been relying on government sources to even put out before even putting out their own communications. So PR agents, uh, brand communication uh, dockets, 
have been using government information or passing the, uh, the information from the government first, then they secured the information. So that has sort of uh, removed any rumors, what do you call it, sort of not, not really straight information or correct information from the public. Uh, a second thing that has been done is apart from the digital channels, you find that in the rural areas where people are quite prone to, prone to rumors. Uh, so I, I think I remember there was a rumor where if you take tea, it, you will be heard. Such things, the government has again partnered, partnered with local, local radio hosts and local radio communications just to remove such, such rumors. In terms of corporates, I've not seen so many corporates uh, capturing rumors or being reactive. However, I've seen most corporates being proactive in terms of giving you the correct guidelines on how to wear a mask, giving you the correct guidelines on how to, how to wash your hands, giving you the correct guidelines. I feel like most of the information has been proactive rather than reactive to counter any rumor. And this has, especially the stem or where it started was the government. So, most brands or all brands that are, that are put out information have to again pass through the government to make sure that everything is aligned before sending it up. I think that collaboration has helped a lot in curbing rumors and curbing a lot of a lot of disparities in the message that's sent out. So um question. So as as an event as an events person, what's the vi vi viability of organizing an online concert, workshop, etc. How do I monetize this? How do I get people to consume this content online? So if you're organizing an event online, number one, the most or what one the first Pivotal, pivotal thing that you have to get right is what event are you hosting? What again? An online an online event shifts from being an experience to online content. So how good is your online content? Are you who are you bringing to the event? Uh, is there something new about the event? Is it is it uh, is it a launch of something new? Is it an act bringing a new product? Uh, a new sorry, a new album, is it uh, a collaboration between artists that we've never had before? So number one, if you're organizing an online concert, you have to be sure that you have something that is very eye catch. If it's in the music sector, are you bringing together uh, various artists who have never collaborated together to do a show? It's, um, if it's an what do you call it? If it's an online gaming event, are you pairing the best with the best, or are you pairing certain groups together that people are famous for? So again, if you're an events person, if, uh, organizing an event online shifts from a brand experience to online content. So you have to make sure it's very, very relatable and something that people will watch. I think an example, Kenya, that I'm seeing is quite uh is quite big is churchill i think churchill has done it in a in quite a nice way so instead of the normal churchill live shows that he's been having so as not to be offline he's he's been running this churchill stories with various comedians that showing just seeing the life and journey that these comedians walked through before reaching to where they are that's the lango recommendi etc so again he's shifted from giving an experience where you come to the church you show, uh, have all these dancers, have all these um, cultural themes and all this, and now shifting it to online content where he's sure someone will definitely want to know how it started, how his journey was in, in, um, in, his, in his comedy. And so again, if it's online, it moves to online content. You have to make sure you have something that I will say a bit for. Yeah. Uh, the, video uh, the video will be on YouTube. Uh, the link shall be shared out to you. So you have a full preview of the video as well as the presentation. 
as well as the links uh, links to all the research that has guided me in doing the presentation. So if you want to copy paste it, use it for your own for other presentations. If you want to pick something or read something more, that shall be shared. Yeah. Um, I'll take the last question. So So uh, what, what leads to success for those creating online content to build followers in steps, first steps? Um, one, uh, the digital world right now, followers are not, a metric that, are not a main metric that most consumers look for. Your, your main metric will be based upon your engagement online. Are people engaging with your content? Number two, are people converting as leads for your business? Number three, uh, are you reaching as many people as you want? So again, building building of of online content is pegged on the pillar of nation you're looking at. So if it's purely consumer education, you're talking to a specific. Segment. If it's just reach and awareness based on a promotion, you're talking to this specific segment. So in terms of growing followers, I've, uh, organic growth of followers is a uh, is more is a more stronger stronger metric as opposed to again paying buying of followers uh, using paid media. So the organic growth of followers is only dictated by good content and knowing your audience. So is the audience based between this age and this age? Do they want to know about a product? Do they want to know about a service that uh, that the category which do they want to be communicated in uh, and all that? So, yeah. I, I that's about it from my end. Uh, enjoy your, enjoy the rest of your week. I hope we've started off the week on now. Uh, on a, on a high note. So at least if you're doing any strategies, if you're responding to anything, you have a clear picture of what's going to happen. Okay. Um, bye bye. And have a good week ahead. Stay safe, sanitize, uh, wash your hands, and keep social distancing. Uh, make sure you, you uh, engage in the safe social distancing experiences so watch a movie work from home use house party to connect to you to connect to your friends try online gaming if you've not tried it and you might be shocked okay bye bye